Good morning, Brampton Chinese Baptist Church. Welcome to Sunday worship. And as we begin worship this morning, for our call to worship, won't you join me in praying this liturgical prayer before the Lord? God of healing, God of wholeness, we bring our brokenness, our sinfulness, our fears, and despair, and lay them at your feet. God of healing, God of wholeness, we hold out hearts and hands, minds and souls to feel your touch and know the peace that only you can bring. God of healing, God of wholeness, this precious moment in your presence and power Grant us faith and confidence that here broken lives are made whole. We pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen. i 
Father God, I want to give thanks to you today that you have brought us uh, together here to worship you on your holy day. Lord, we thank you because of your love that you have gathered your people here uh, to worship you. Lord, we want to give all glory and honor to your holy name. Lord, we thank you that you have called us to be your children and that we have a share in your kingdom. Lord, we thank you for, though we are uh, insignificant, Lord, you have looked down on us because of your mercy. For that, Lord, we give thanks, we praise you. Lord, we want to pray that at this day, Lord, you um, wash us off our cleanses, Lord, and so that we can come before your holy throne to worship you. Lord, we know that there are many times that we didn't love you as we should. For that, Lord, I pray that you forgive us. Lord, I thank you for uh, keeping us safe each day when we go in and out of the house. Lord, we thank you because you have watched over us and watched our footsteps in many ways that we didn't even are aware of. Lord, you have um, already taken care of us for all the needs that we need. Lord, we want to pray for the, the sick and for those who are weak. We pray for those who lost their jobs and are still waiting for, uh, looking for jobs. So Lord, we pray for your providence. For those who are sick, Lord, we pray for your healing. We pray for your comfort. Lord, we uh, give thanks for uh, providing for our needs. And Lord, we pray for uh, those countries that are still uh, have a lot of uh, COVID cases. And we pray for your deliverance, Lord, and pray for uh, for the rollout of vaccines for many countries who are still uh, have shortage. Lord, I pray for your providence. Lord, we thank you for uh, our coming upcoming retreat. Lord, we looking forward to it, and we pray for the both the pastors uh, that will be speakers in the camp. We pray that you prepare our hearts to receive your words. We pray for the pastors that will be uh, speaking uh, your words to us. I pray that you would empower them. You will anoint their message. Give them the words to speak to us so that, Lord, we will be built up in your words. And that, Lord, we pray that our hearts will be teachable and learn to be humble before you. Lord, may you use uh, each one of us here uh, so that we can extend your kingdom and bring glory to you. Lord, we give thanks and please hear our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Second Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 and 17 to 27. After the death of Saul, David returned from striking down the Amalekites and stayed in Ziklag two days. David took up this lament concerning Saul and his son Jonathan. And he ordered that the people of Judah be taught this lament of the bow. A gazelle lies slain on your heights, Israel. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines be glad, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised rejoice. Mountains of Gilboa, may you have neither dew nor rain. May no showers fall on your terraced fields. For there the shield of the mighty was despised, the shield of Saul, no longer rubbed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the flesh of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, the sword of Saul did not return unsatisfied. Saul and Jonathan, in life they were loved and admired, and in death they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. Daughters of Israel, weep for Saul, who clothed you in scarlet and finery, who adorned your garments with ornaments of gold. How the mighty have fallen in battle, Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. 
You were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. How the mighty have fallen, the weapons of war have perished. Psalm 130 Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 7 to 15. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work, so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it, according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Mark chapter 5, verse 21 to 43. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leader, named Jairus, came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was free from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you? His disciples answered. And yet you can ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kom, 
which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was twelve years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this, and told them to give her something to eat. Good morning, church. When I was in kindergarten, I remember in our classroom the teacher、uh, would set aside a table and two small chairs at the corner of the room,、uh, and on this table would be. Uh, always a pack of these delicious cookies.、Uh, the name of the cookies escape me, but they're they're still around today. They're the、uh, I think Christy makes them. They're the square sugar cookies,、um, and、uh, there would be a small pitcher of juice with some cups. And there was one rule: everybody was allowed to have one、uh, cup of juice and one cookie. That was it. You were allowed to sit down at the table, have one juice, one cookie,、uh, but only once a day, because、uh, these cookies were for everybody. Now, again, they were delicious, and I loved them, and I was so tempted to have more, and I wasn't the only one. Some of the kids actually made an attempt to sneak in a second、uh, helping, or you know, they would have one, play around, and then maybe an hour or two later, they would go back. If the teacher would catch someone trying to sneak in another one, they would stop. And、uh, stop them and say, "Look, you cannot eat all that you want." Now you may be satisfied, but, but why don't you think about everybody else? If somebody else didn't have cookies and they wanted it because you took all of them, that wouldn't be fair, would it? You need to be fair. I think of all the lessons that I learned as a kid, this sort of <laughs> this sort of、um, is, is sort of highlighted.、Uh, but you know, this is something that I was generally taught. As an adolescent, not only at school but by my peers, by、uh, my parents at home, and obviously these things、uh, are good for all of us to learn. And for this reason, obviously, I was always taught. Well, maybe this is the way life should be. Now, fast forward a few years later, I was、uh, still fairly young. I don't know, maybe nine or ten, and、uh, I was lamenting about something to my mother.、Uh, When I say lamenting, I was whining and complaining.、Um, I can't remember what I was whining and complaining about, but, uh, about, but I was、uh, I was pretty upset and I was pretty distraught. And at the end of my rambling, I said, "It's just not fair." My mother、uh, proceeded to、uh, listen to me as、uh, patiently or as patiently as she could,、uh, and then she just stopped me and she just blurted out something that I will never forget. She said, "Listen, Dan." Life is not fair. Deal with it. Now that was a rude awakening for me. Really, wow! Life is not fair. Yet we're taught these manners. We are taught about again courtesy and consideration. But the reality is, life just isn't fair. Why? Don't we teach each other fairness after all? Maybe we don't teach each other enough. Or maybe those who are the recipients of these lessons, they just don't listen. Maybe life just isn't meant to be fair. Maybe it's socially constructed. Maybe it has to do with、uh, the the pravity of、uh, of the human heart. In other words, we are just self-centered. Maybe as Christians, we've asked God at some point in our life, "Why isn't life fair?" Or we look around the world and we ask God, "Why do we see all that we see?" And today we are reading the Gospel of Mark and Jesus proceeding in his ministry and healing. Now, the more I read the Gospels, the more I read about our Lord Jesus, the more I realize that his heart is all about fairness, contrary to what we might see around us. James says in his epistles that you know we should not show favoritism. God does not show favoritism, so neither should we. He gives the example of somebody coming into church. If somebody is poor, seems poor, we are not to treat them differently. If、um, uh, then the person who is rich, who comes in with all these expensive clothes, because Jesus died for everybody. Jesus loves everybody equally. The gospel is for everyone. When Jesus was on earth, he preached to the poor.、Uh, he、um, he healed the sick. He did not discriminate. He said, "The kingdom of God is near." You. 
Now, in today's particular text, Mark chapter 5, we are reading about Jesus healing a couple of people. And and let's read what it says here, uh, starting from verse 21 uh, to 29. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him uh, while he was by the lake. Uh, Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Uh, When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that uh, she was freed from her suffering. Okay? So, let's point the scenario here. We have two people who are in need, who come to Jesus. And um, two things that, uh, uh, one thing that these two individuals have in common is their faith in Jesus to heal. So let's not make any mistake about that. First, we have uh, Jairus. And it says that Jairus was a synagogue leader. Now, if Jairus was a synagogue leader, we need to understand that in society, this man uh, was a person of position, of standing, and authority. But again, nevertheless, he did have faith, so we're not, we're not faulting him for this. This was just his social uh, situation, and his daughter was dying. Right? And we also need to understand that uh, he was, again, a man. Like, a man can only, only a man in, in society can have this kind of position. In contrast, we have uh, the second person. Now, this person is, uh, first of all, a woman. And uh, women, women back then did not have any status or position in society. And notice that, uh, unlike Jairus, this woman does not have a name. Uh, this also paints a portrait that in society, she was relatively insignificant. She didn't have uh, an identity, so to speak. And uh, she was also, as it says here, uh, she had this condition um, where, uh, where she couldn't stop bleeding. Uh, this, uh, she was a hemophiliac, constant bleeding. Now, uh, according to the, uh, the Levitical law, if we look specifically at Levit- uh, Leviticus 13, uh, she was ceremonially unclean. Now, there were certain ritualistic and, and uh, cleanliness laws that uh, Moses had, um, had uh, prescribed. If I can use that word. And uh, depending on what the situ- uh, condition was, it wasn't a sin, it wasn't bad. It's just if you were unclean, it was usually temporary. Now, if this woman, or rather since she was a hemophiliac, she couldn't stop bleeding, she was constantly unclean. Um, which meant that she was a perpetual outcast in society. I think you get the point here. She really was nobody. Life isn't fair, is it? Now, we cannot blame the crowd uh, about anything here because like it says in the text, uh, she did this without anybody knowing. She literally snuck up behind Jesus. But at the same time, let's be honest with ourselves. How often would we, as people, overlook such people in society? Especially when we have someone who is quote-unquote more important, who is waiting for us. Who are the people in our lives, in your life, in my life, who are more important and also who are less important? Either in our lives, again, or people in society. Are there more important people, more powerful, more rich, uh, we, uh, in the age of uh, celebrities, who are the people in our lives who may seem less? Now, we play favorites with people, uh, whether, like, whether or not we, want, as a society, want to admit it, right? 
People favor groups, whether it's social, political, economic, ethnic, and maybe even within our own communities. Now, I'm an only child, so uh, I really cannot relate to this, but you know, we all hear about so many parents playing favorites with their children. Favorite people, and, and if we think about church life, this can also apply. But this is not what Jesus' heart is here. If we keep reading in verse 30, it says, uh, at once Jesus, this is after, um, uh, it says after, after um, she was healed. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in, in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? Uh, you see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Now, time was of the essence here. Surely it was not Jesus' heart for Jairus' uh, young daughter to die. Remember, she said, uh, Jairus said, My little daughter is dying. Please ha come and help me. Come and help her. When he arrived, she had already passed. Now, perhaps someone would have lamented something like uh, something akin to what Mary and Martha said to Jesus in the Gospel of John. Lord, if you had come earlier, my daughter would not have died. Why didn't you come earlier? Now, as we know, he did bring her back to life. But why didn't Jesus come earlier? I mean, after all, this girl did not stop uh, Jesus. She didn't, like, tug on his, on his clothing and say, Jesus, can you help me? She didn't want to be a father. She did not talk to him. She literally, again, snuck up behind Jesus, touched his cloak, and, yeah, again, did not want to be a burden to him, didn't want to bother anybody. Now, she would have walked away if Jesus had led her, but he didn't. He stopped her. Why? Why did Jesus take the time to stop uh, in his tracks and talk to this girl and say, come out, I need you to tell me what you did? And she was initially scared because in her mind, she did something wrong. Now, in a way, we can say that she did. If, uh, according to the Levitical law, if, or uh, the Mosaic law, if you are ceremonially unclean, you are not supposed to touch any. Well, if you touch something in your ceremonial unclean, uh, that object becomes ceremonially unclean. Let alone, can you imagine touching Jesus' clothing here? She broke the Jewish purity law. But it said that the power went out of Jesus and healed her. Now, let's not make any mistake about it. This is not a random, arbitrary, supernatural act. This is not superstition or magic. God healed this young girl. The kingdom of God came upon her, and God wanted to let her know that. It was God's will, his heart, for this woman who had been in constant perpetual healing, uh, 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 pain, to be healed. I think it's also worth knowing that, you know, when it says that this girl touched his clothing, uh, it wasn't just clothing. What was Jesus wearing, right? He was wearing a robe, or what we call a talith, more commonly known as a, a prayer shawl. And on it were these tassels. Uh, and more specifically, there were four of them. And, and this is what she touched. It was one of the four uh, tassels. And the representat representation of these tassels is that uh, these tassels would um, spread to the four corners of the earth just the way God's uh, vastness, His sovereignty spreads all across the world. And we see this here. Not only His sovereignty, but who He is, His love in his heart to save the world. The vastness of God is being declared here. Some people think that her healing didn't uh, come without, uh, in, without a cost, that she had to do some sort of hard work by admitting in public what she did. But this is not the case. This is not why Jesus stopped her and called her out. 
It was necessary in Jesus' eyes for this woman to publicly declare what she did because Jesus was publicly declaring her clean. In other words, Jesus declared her clean and thus reinstates her back into the community vis-a-vis the Mosaic law. Was it worth it for Jesus to stop what he was doing? Um, which was uh, going to Jairus' home to save this poor woman who was also potentially dying. No one could prevent her from, no one could heal her. She was, uh, Jesus was her only hope. Let's read, uh, let's continue reading what it says in, from verse 35 to 43. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead. They said, why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told them, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He said to her by, uh, he took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the, good, uh, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Jesus came to save all, and for a poor child of Israel, such as this woman, he made her healing and restoration public all, uh, uh, for all to see. Right? They would have seen her as clean and safe. Now, it's interesting here in this passage that when he came to heal Jairus' daughter, he does it in private. Why? Well, those who saw Jesus... Uh, or, or rather heard Jesus say that, look, this woman is not dead, but it's, this girl is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him. They ridiculed him. So there is that contrast there. There is no favoritism here. Jesus reveals to, him, uh, to uh, himself to those who are willing and who have that heart. But if, your heart, if their heart is not open, Jesus will still heal this girl. Because he loves her. But to those who hold Jesus in disdain, he says, okay, well, you know, you will not see what happens. We also need to address something else here. Right? This uh, woman was not only uh, socially or economically uh, unprivileged, um, but she also does represent uh, something or some uh, some someone else here, or, or, or a group of people, whatever you want to call it. Now, it says here that she did touch his clothes. Now, when I read this narrative, it reminds me of uh, Acts chapter 19. Do you remember when uh, there was mass healing going on? It says that, uh, is that uh, some people would even bring handkerchiefs to Paul. And Paul would touch these handkerchiefs and, and whoever was a recipient of touching these uh, handkerchiefs thereafter would be healed. Let's be honest here. This sounds a bit like superstition to me, doesn't it? I don't think we can pretend anything else. How would you feel it if, if, if I or another pastor said, okay, I'm going to touch this handkerchief in Jesus' name and if anyone needs healing, take it and let them be healed. You probably think I'm crazy now, but it's, it's, it's here in Scripture. What does this tell us? I don't... Because, again, God did heal her. I believe that God healed her, not because of her stup- uh, superstitious beliefs or anything, but He saw her situation. What else could she do? What other choice did she have? If she went publicly to speak to Jesus, a lot of people would try to shun her and tell her to just stop talking. She was desperate. And this is all she knew. 
It was her last resort. This also speaks about the vastness of God. That in the end, God is not going to ridicule this girl and say, listen, you did not take the proper approach. He saw that she had faith. She was in a desperate situation and it was his heart to heal her. Let's not make any mistake about it here. God is not proposing superstition, but he sees their hearts. Now, how do you and I understand and apply this uh, in terms of our Christian love to one another? Again, God looks at the heart. Sometimes there are going to be Christians uh, whom we come across we, and we may not believe every single thing that they believe. Uh, let me uh, give you an example. I remember uh, several years ago uh, when this one particular uh, worship song came out. Uh, I remember it was called Reckless Love. Now, when the song Reckless Love came out, it was a very, very divisive song. Some people loved it. A lot of people hated it. Right? And I understand the argument because I've heard it. Because how can you say God's love is reckless? God's love isn't reckless. It's proper. There's a, it's structured. It's order. It's very orderly. Could the person who had written the song use a different adjective? Maybe. But honestly, I remember when Gladys and I heard this song and people liked it. We understood why. Right? We understand the meaning behind it. When we are faced with the Holy One of Israel, and I've said this many times, God, because He is holy, cannot tolerate sin. But yet, He does extend His love and His saving grace to us. When we realize that we are depraved in our sin, how does that make sense? How is that orderly? How is that structured? It does not make sense. And for some people, this phenomenon is so overwhelming. It's just like, wow, it doesn't make sense to me, but I know that I know that I know it's real. It's true. And again, when this song first came up, I remember speaking to a, uh, a sister in Christ who, uh, who played uh, this song on a worship team at church. And uh, we were having a conversation. And uh, she was saying that after the worship service, someone in a congregation proceeded to come up to her and say, listen, this song that you sang, Reckless Love, is not proper for worship. And then he proceeded to um, go point by point by point why theologically this song was not proper. And at that point, it was clear that this was not a uh, off-the-cusp, spontaneous conversation. It was clear that this person went out of his way to really think about it, to research it, write all these points down, and to rehearse it. And he also went out of his way to pretty much headhunt anyone who would proceed to uh, play this song. And we said to each other, well, why do we need to do this to one another? Okay, fine. It may, it, it may not please you. I mean, I think we need to make a clear distinction. If there is a particular worship song that is blatantly blasphemous, that compromises the core elements of faith, right? If, if I hear a song that goes, Jesus is not the Son of God, I'd be like, we're not singing that. We're not. But if there is a song that is just expressing uh, the love of God, uh, that is not uh, explainable. We can't explain it, let alone explain it away. Shouldn't we be humble enough to let others have that? And that was the point that, uh, uh, that they were trying to make. Why do we do this to one another? Right? Especially if someone is new to the faith. If somebody uh, comes to the faith and is a new Christian and, and they feel this kind of love and they sing reckless love, yeah, I'm not going to stop them from that. God does not show favoritism. He did not show favoritism to this, let's call it, she was maybe a superstitious woman. But he rewarded her for her faith. So with God, there is no favoritism. You and I are all equal. Jesus did not love this bleeding woman any more than he, or any less than uh, he loved Jairus. 
nor did he, again, love her any less. He met their needs accordingly. Now, in the same way, he died so that every one of us could have life. And brothers and sisters, my prayer here is that we can continue in our love for our Lord through our love for one another and in and out of the church. How do we view the people who are not like us? Whether they're in a different social class, ethnicity, um, what have you. Do we still believe that God still died for them? And if God put them in our lives, do we care enough about them that we find out ways we can serve them? We can love them. Now, on, uh, on uh, this past Friday night, uh, we were, uh, during the youth group Bible study, we, we didn't study a particular book. Actually, we're looking into um, spiritual gifts. What gifts uh, the Lord has entrusted to his people? Now, usually if we say in church life that someone is extremely gifted for the church, a lot of times, at least um, traditionally from my experience, uh, these two particular gifts, the gifts that stand out the most are, or put on a pedestal, not to mince words, is preaching and making music. Oh, this person can speak really well or, or can sing really well. But there are so many more gifts, more spiritual gifts that God has given to his church to bless her, to glorify him. And my hope and prayer is that you know, we as a church, we will know and understand that God gives so many more uh, uh, gifts and talents, appoints so many people, and they are just as valuable than the next. Do we elevate one particular gift over another? Do we compare? Let us continue to plead that our spiritual eyes be open so that we can see one another through the eyes of Christ and not our own.
from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Revelation chapter 1 verses 5 to 6. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the kingdom which you are bringing down from heaven as we await with expectancy, as we await. May we continue to love you. May we continue to love our neighbors. May we continue to allow people to see your kingdom through our love and our actions in our communities and our families and to those whom you have called, um, called us to in terms of uh, workplace, the people we know, the people we meet. Lord, may you continue to work in our lives. May you continue to bless your church. May you uh, bring healing and restoration and revival in our lives, in our communities, in our churches. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I dance before the Lord. No one understands the Jews. Not even the Jews. Meekles, for once in your cognitively constipated life, you didn't just listen to me. Where do I go when I'm afraid? Oh, go ahead, Ethan. We go to, like, God. Okay. How do you do that? Wait a minute. There's a massive project in school, and I, we were supposed to be doing in partners, but I had no one to do it with, so I had to do it by myself, so I asked God for help. Oh, oh good stuff. Wow. It's so hard to, yeah. to speak it and share it with other people. They may not understand, but our God understands, right? Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your cause than thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your course, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your course than thousands elsewhere. Hey y'all, y'all, come and see. There's a man by a well. He knew everything about me. Everything. He has the water. He is the Messiah. God's own man, the spirit and the truth. One I ask and I would see. Your beauty to find you in the place your glory dwells. Hear my prayer, Lord Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Better is one day in your court. One day. Better is one day. Better is one day in your house than a thousand elsewhere. A thousand. One thousand to one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. My friend, my fresh cry out, for you're the living God. Your spirit's water for my soul. I've tasted and I have seen, come once again to me. I will draw near to you. I will draw near to you. Awesome 
arts and worship camp gives you permission to fail, to try things and screw it up, gives you permission to think and dream, and gives you permission to take responsibility. Because at the end of a camp, you'll have something to offer to God, to your Creator. Because we're not talking about Jesus a lot when we do the art. We're doing Jesus. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts and thousands elsewhere. If you don't know how to talk to God or to praise God, the Psalms are your best prayer book and praise book. They give you the right words to say to God. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts and thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts and thousands elsewhere. Thank you.